August 1964, the mighty F-8 Crusader catapults into history. Feared by all North Vietnamese pilots, this lethal fighter earns the nickname MiG Master. But as cannon give way to missiles, the Crusader becomes the last of the gunfighters. My fellow Americans, as President and Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. On August 5th, 1964, American aircraft from the USS Ticonderoga catapulted into history. For America, this was the beginning of the Vietnam War. As with Korea over a decade before, the US Navy was the first to engage the enemy on a large scale. Uninhibited by the diplomatic and logistical snares encountered when operating from foreign airfields, the Navy had been poised to strike well before Washington was ready to make that crucial decision. Most of the attack missions were carried out by A-4 Skyhawks, A-1 Sky Raiders, and A-6 Intruders. Operation Rolling Thunder was the prevailing military strategy during the early years of the conflict. It involved bombing the southern portion of North Vietnam and slowly moving northward towards Hanoi. The assumption was that the communists would give in as the bombing moved northward. However, this scenario underestimated the resolve of the North Vietnamese. Despite its daunting name, Rolling Thunder was a limited tactical approach. Often pilots could only attack targets that first attacked them, and crucial support lines from China were strictly off limits. But the aerial bombardment did take its toll. Under pressure from American attacks, the Air Force of North Vietnam was pressed into service. The most glorified North Vietnamese aircraft during this conflict was the Soviet-built MiG-21. However, the most prolific and effective fighter in Hanoi's arsenal was actually the older MiG-17. The MiG-17 was agile and very effective in hit-and-run attacks on American aircraft. To defend the vulnerable bombers from North Vietnamese MiGs, the Navy employed a fighter that since 1961 had been the pride of the fleet. The Crusader was arguably the greatest air superiority fighter of its time. Fighting MiGs was clearly what this plane was designed to do. U.S. Marine Corps Major General P. Drax Williams graduated from Cornell University and was commissioned in 1963. He flew his first combat tour in 1965 with the Marine Corps Squadron in Vietnam. Flying out of Da Nang, Williams flew perhaps the most dangerous missions of all, ground support for the Marines. Having risen through the ranks, he will always remember the plane that brought him home safely. This great old bird right here is the F-8 Crusader, once proudly known as last of the gunfighters. I flew it from 1965 to 1968 and did a tour in combat in uh, Da Nang in 1967 to 68. It was powered by a great big Pratt & Whitney J-57 P-20 Alpha, which won an award for being the first engine to sustain 10,000 pounds of thrust. <laughs> 
and basic engine, an afterburner, it would put out about 18,500 pounds of thrust. There are several interesting features about this aircraft. One of them is this unit horizontal tail. It didn't have elevators, and at the high supersonic speeds that the aircraft flew at, the whole tail moved up and down, which of course controlled the pitch. Another were these ventral fins right here. These were added on after several accidents as the aircraft was being catapulted off a carrier. Sometimes it tended to swap ends. These babies kept them straight. One of the very unusual aspects of this aircraft, unique in fact, is this wing. Most aircraft have flaps in order to slow down. This aircraft has no flaps. This wing raises up and the fuselage lowers. That allows the bird to slow down so the pilot can either land aboard a carrier or ashore. If due to some reason, battle damage, the wing doesn't come up, then he has to land in excess of 200 knots to avoid landing on the tail. At the onset of the Vietnam War, the Crusader was combat ready. In the early days of the conflict, it was used extensively as a fighter escort, protecting bombers from MiG attacks. Vectored to enemy aircraft by E-2 Hawkeyes and Super Constellations, the speedy Crusader would engage enemy fighters well before they could become a threat to the vulnerable bombers. It was in this role that the Crusader earned its famed nickname, MiG Master. High above the jungle mountains of North Vietnam, elite battles were waged between fighter pilots determined to secure air supremacy. Not unlike the dogfights of the Korean War, sophisticated American fighters met head-to-head -head with their non-Russian pilots flying Russian-built planes. The MiG-17, seen here in the gun sights of an American pilot, was indeed a formidable adversary. But the North Vietnamese pilots are generally considered less skilled than the Russians, and were thus thought unable to use the plane to its fullest potential. MiG-17 pilots practiced hit-and-run tactics, preferring to leave the scene rather than sticking around to fight. The Crusader was well respected by North Vietnamese pilots. In fact, there was an occasion where a MiG-17 pilot allegedly ejected from his plane when he saw a Crusader closing in from behind. This is rare footage of MiG-21s being shot down over North Vietnam. The first Crusader victory over a MiG-21 occurred on October 9, 1966, when a pilot deployed from the USS Hancock locked on to the speedy Delta wing and fired his sidewinder. Although the F-4 Phantom accounted for three quarters of all MiG kills in Vietnam, the Crusader boasts the highest kill ratio scoring 19 MiG kills with only three air combat losses. Despite the Crusader's superiority over the MiGs, air combat was always a harrowing experience. Some people say that flying is hours and hours of boredom punctuated by stark moments of terror. I think we got our, our share over there. I'll never forget, of course, being shot at. I don't think anybody ever will. That's the first time I think you're ever convinced of your own mortality. The Crusader, with its four 20-millimeter cannon, had developed a reputation as a gunfighter even before the outbreak of the Vietnam War. But it was the Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles that proved most effective against North Vietnamese MiGs. In fact, of the 19 MiG kills credited to the Crusader, only one was achieved solely through cannon fire. Here, a MiG-17 pilot is attempting to evade an onrushing Sidewinder, but it is already too late. In order for a fighter pilot to be combat ready when called into action, he must be well practiced in the elite art of aerial combat. This is Miramar, California, nicknamed 
Fighter Town, USA. In 1968, the Navy established fighter training school for its pilots. It was here that the Navy's two premier fighters first came head to head in a simulated combat. It is Crusader versus Phantom. In what is now known as Top Gun School, this mock dogfight training was underscored by the intense rivalry between the pilots of these two very different aircraft. As with the early dogfighters of World War I and the Spitfires and the ME-109s over the skies of Britain in World War II, the key is to get the enemy on the defensive. Although technology changes, fighter tactics remain the same. Crusader and Phantom begin their dogfight beyond the visual range of one another. Radar must be employed to find the adversary. But radar is a double-edged sword. Although it alerts the pilot to the presence of his foe, turning it on makes him the biggest target in the sky. The Phantom hunts down the Crusader. In a defensive maneuver, the Crusader makes a hard left turn, and the two planes meet head on. From now on, all contact will be visual. It is a classic dogfight. In the 1960s, the Crusader and the Phantom were arguably the greatest air superiority fighters in the world. And not surprisingly, the rivalry between the two was intense. The Crusader pilots saw themselves as true fighter jocks, uninhibited by the multi-mission role performed by the Phantom. Likewise, Phantom pilots joked the Crusader's cannons represented the technology of an older generation. But like all inter-service rivalries, it was that of two siblings. They were competitive, but when push came to shove, they were on the same side. To this day, Crusader pilots maintain that their plane is simply unbeatable. Rear Admiral Robert Smith flew the Crusader. Cleaned up and in a fighter role, it is the best airplane there is to fly. It is more fun than anything you can imagine. It's the hot rod, the sports car of uh, aviation. I've never met a person who who's flown it in aerial combat. Uh, dissimilar tactics or dogfighting in the old days who didn't really enjoy it. Now, to land it and bring it aboard a boat, now that's a different question. One of my most vivid memories is, uh, of course, bringing the airplane aboard ship. It was hard to bring aboard ship, always accelerating or decelerating, and if you didn't fly the airplane, it was going to fly you. And then once you got aboard, if you got a perfect three-wire, which is the best pass you can make on a small carrier that was about 12 feet hooked to ramp clearance. And then the flight deck personnel were always trying to taxi you off the edge of the uh, carrier, it seemed, because the nose gear is about six or seven feet behind the pilot. So the uh, flight deck crew would bring you right up to the edge of the carrier, the nose wheel, the pilot would be over the water and you'd see nothing but water running by underneath. And you had to have an awful lot of faith in those young men. For an aircraft to perform as a fighter, it must be extremely maneuverable. But of course, in order for a plane to be made more agile, stability must be taken away. While instability is the friend of any pilot engaged in the chaotic game of aerial combat, during landing, it becomes his enemy. The Crusader's blazing speed and prowess as an elite Navy fighter draws comparisons to its famed ancestor, the F-4U Corsair. Like the Crusader, the chance vaught F-4U was one of the fastest Navy fighters of its time. But also like the Crusader, it was unforgiving on landings. So unforgiving, in fact, 
that had earned an unflattering sobriquet, the Ensign Eliminator. For obvious reasons, the Navy was not fond of airplanes that were difficult to bring aboard a ship. For three years, this distinctive fighter with its inverted gull wings had helped to neutralize Japanese air power. But during this period, it only operated from land bases. Then something happened. Losing their grip on the Pacific, a desperate Japanese military began their infamous kamikaze attacks. Diving headlong towards American ships, these suicide-bent pilots could outrace any Navy fighter, except the Corsair. As kamikaze attacks became increasingly relentless, the Corsair was pressed into squadron service aboard U.S. carriers, where it would serve with distinction until the end of the war. By the early 1950s, jet-powered fighters had established a monopoly within the U.S. Navy. In the late 40s, the Navy had been suspicious of jets, citing their high takeoff and landing speeds as less reliable aboard a carrier than proven piston aircraft. However, the gradual acceptance of pure jet fighters took hold just in time. During the Korean War, the success of carrier-borne jets like the Grumman Panther and the Douglas Banshee proved that jet propulsion was here to stay. The Chance Vought Company had less success in the early days of jet aircraft than did their competitors at Douglas, Grumman, and North American. Its first attempt at a jet was the XFU Pirate, which never made it beyond the prototype stage. Vought's next endeavor showed more promise, at least on paper. The F-7U Cutlass was the first naval fighter designed with afterburners and swept wing. Despite its potential, the Cutlass was plagued with problems. Its weak climb rate earned it the nickname Gutless and its high accident rate made it unpopular among naval pilots. After producing two losers, Vought was falling from favor with the Navy, and in 1952, when the Navy released specifications for a new Mach 1 fighter, Vought had only one last chance to produce a winner. With their backs to the wall, the Vought team forged ahead with unprecedented swiftness. By June of 55, the Crusader took to the air at Edwards Air Force Base. On its maiden flight, test pilot John Conrad did the unthinkable. He went supersonic. After the familiarization flights came the most dangerous part of any flight test program, spin recovery. During a spin test, the pilot will drop over 30,000 feet in a matter of seconds. He must examine the responsiveness of a plane he is uncertain will even stay intact, all the while enduring the disorienting and physically punishing effects of excessive G-forces. John Conrad endured the brunt of spin testing for vault, and the Crusader never let him down. All of the early Crusader training was completed without the luxury of a trainer. In fact, it would not be until 1962 that a trainer would be introduced. Many pilots who flew the Crusader early on felt that this trainer came too late. Test pilot John Conrad explains. I must add that the Navy at that time in life did not believe in building two-place tactical trainers. The Air Force did. I feel that uh, the Navy might have saved several of the losses of airplanes by neophyte pilots had they been trained in the two-place airplane. 
The two-seat Crusader, or Two-Sater as it became known, was never widely used in the training of young Navy fighter pilots. So when the Crusader first entered service with the Navy back in 1957, pilots had to make their first flight alone. Initial carrier qualifications on the Crusader were carried out in April of 1956 aboard the USS Forrestal. Captain Duke Windsor made 12 catapult shots and 12 landings without incident. Surviving the ultimate test of any potential naval aircraft, the Crusader began its service career with the Navy. During Allied exercises in the Mediterranean, British Canberra bombers practiced mock attack missions on American ships. The impunity with which the high-flying Canberras carried out these attacks did not please Admiral Cat Brown of the 6th Fleet. When the fleet received its first crusaders, Brown used the occasion to teach the British a lesson in naval air combat. Canberra pilots were stunned to find this new American aircraft making vertical passes at their bombers. The British were not the only aviators to be outperformed by the Navy's rising star. Since 1955, the F-100 Super Sabre had held the world speed record of Mach 1.25. As the world's fastest airplane, this sleek fighter bomber was the pride of the U.S. Air Force. However, with the arrival of the Crusader, the F-100's records began to fall. In late August of 1956, Duke Windsor took the Crusader to Mach 1.5 shattering the F-100's record. A year later, a young Marine pilot named John Glenn would attempt a record-breaking coast-to-coast flight. It was called Project Bullet. We called it Project Bullet uh, because if it came off the way we wanted it to, uh, to come off, which, which did work out, I would average uh, more speed from coast-to-coast -coast than the muzzle velocity of a 45 caliber bullet. What Project Bullet also achieved was to fuel the intensifying rivalry between the Navy and the Air Force. The Air Force had held the record, and we wanted to break the record, and we did. In fact, we asked the Air Force if uh, they would loan us some of their jet tankers for this, and they refused. <laughs> the plane that we actually used for this was a photographic version which happened to have a little more fuel and also had cameras that would take side pictures as well as vertical pictures. And so we loaded all the cameras up and started them running at a, a regular speed, uh, taking off out of Los Alamitos. And I think we did the first uh, continual strip picture, uh, clear cross country from west coast to east coast. While the Crusader was busily breaking every record in the book, Chance Vaught was aiming even higher. In 1956, they designed a plane that was meant to be the ultimate air superiority fighter. This is the F-8U-3, nicknamed the Super Crusader. The Super Crusader was an aggressive looking airplane, but although it shared the F-8 designation with its little brother, there were many differences between the two fighters. In 1957, the era of the gunfighter was already perceived to be nearing the end. Fearing that the Crusader was on the fast track to obsolescence, the Super Crusader would carry only missiles. Another difference was the addition of large ventral fins designed to help keep the plane stable at transonic speeds. Like the Crusader, the Super Crusader's wings lifted for better low-speed handling, but an additional five feet of wingspan and four feet of fuselage made it considerably larger. The larger airframe was supplemented by an enormous Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine that was meant to propel this fighter interceptor beyond Mach 3. 
The Super Crusader was first flown by test pilot John Conrad in June of 1958. Later that summer, it would reach a blazing Mach 2.6, and in a final round of test flights late in the year, it remained the only competitor to the mighty F-4 Phantom. From a performance standpoint and an air-to-air -air combat standpoint, i.e. dogfighting standpoint, there was no comparison. The F-8U-3 would eat it alive. It was a much faster airplane and much more agile airplane than the F-4 was then or is now. Despite the impressive performance of the Super Crusader, the Navy opted for the twin-engine two-seater Phantom in December of 58. Following the Navy's decision, the F-8U-3 program was canceled and all five aircraft were turned over to NASA for high-altitude, high-speed research. While the Super Crusader program was in the process of cancellation, improvements were being made to the original Crusader. The Vought ejection system was replaced by the British-made Martin Baker seats, which had developed a solid reputation within the aircraft industry. Because of the dangerous nature of carrier flight operations, the seat must safely eject the pilot at low altitudes, low speeds, and even underwater. Not surprisingly, most carrier accidents occur when the plane is coming aboard the ship. Naval airplanes are constantly subjected to crushing landings. Therefore, rugged landing gear is a must. When the Crusader experienced a disturbing series of landing gear failures, Vought engineers conducted an additional series of drop tests in an effort to strengthen the existing gear. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Navy had an insatiable appetite for higher and higher speeds. The massive Pratt & Whitney engines were upgraded, and at the beginning of the turbulent 60s, the Crusader continued to set the pace. Between 1953 and 1963, Cold War fears resulted in an explosive growth in military technology. In the early 50s, jet power was a fledgling technology, while in less than a decade, man was pushing the transonic envelope, and there was even talk about putting a man on the moon. As an early 50s design, the Crusader needed to change with the times. Most of the original Crusaders were taken back to Vought so that their electronics, radar, and weapon systems could be brought up to speed. The result was this, the F-8D. This improved Crusader contained the technologies necessary to maintain an advantage over even the newest Soviet fighters. However, the Crusader's first call to action would not be against Soviet MiGs. In October 1962, Russian missile installations were discovered in Cuba. 
For 10 long days, the world stood on the brink of war. When a high-flying U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba, the U.S. was forced into a different strategy. Photo coverage of Cuba needed to be at almost treetop level to evade Cuban radar. It was here that the photographic version of the Crusader met its first critical challenge. Dubbed Operation Blue Moon, one Navy and one Marine photo Crusader squadron began an intense series of low-level recon missions over Cuba. By the end of the conflict, 160,000 pictures were taken, and both squadrons were personally decorated by President Kennedy. During the Cold War, the U.S. and Soviet military engaged in a continuous game of cat and mouse. It was common for a Soviet bomber, the Tu-95 Bear, to fly over American carrier groups. The Bear was equipped to carry standoff anti-ship missiles, so it was not a threat to be taken lightly. When a Bear was approaching a carrier, Crusaders were sent aloft to greet it. Crusader pilot Hal Loney recalls one such experience. They had a bear and a bison en route to fly over the ship. Anyway, we get out there and we fly, uh, fly a wing on the bear and a bison. I tell you, that's an eerie feeling. Uh, when when a, a gun is tracking you everywhere you go, just, just like that, looking in there. At the same time, these guys are standing in the windows with a Pepsi-Cola bottle. <laughs> The Crusader had been designed to chase Soviet bombers and tangle with Soviet MiGs. As a Navy fighter, it represented a far-reaching extension of U.S. military power, employed to thwart the perceived expansion of Stalin and Khrushchev. However, its baptism of fire would not be against the Russians. By 1959, the leadership of North Vietnam had become dedicated to the goal of creating a unified country. Conflict was nothing new to this region. In 1945, independence for Vietnam was claimed by Nguyen That Tan, known to the world as Ho Chi Minh. Beginning with a voluntary force of only 34, Ho Chi Minh built an army large enough to drive the French from the region. After the victory at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, Ho Chi Minh and his military mastermind, Le Zuan, began looking southward. Through a network of trails, bridges, and rivers, the North Vietnamese funneled supplies to the south to support a communist insurgency against the government in Saigon. From the very beginning of what would become known as the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese were totally committed to the war in the south. By contrast, the U.S. government decided to take a limited approach to the war. The strategy taken was to pacify the North Vietnamese military without implementing provocative measures that may have angered the Soviets. For aviators flying against the North Vietnamese, this limited policy was both frustrating and dangerous. Well, you're flying along and you, you can see a missile site down there, or a SAM missile sitting on a launcher, or triple A, whatever, and you couldn't shoot at it because it was off limits. Unless it shot you or your wingman down, then you could go shoot at it. Well, it's, or you fly down the same road, the same altitude, five days in a row, and you knew sooner or later that, you know, they're going to figure out that, hey, Louis, here he comes again. Let's shoot him. And uh, those were frustrating times. When America entered the war in Vietnam, the North Vietnamese mobilized their entire population to the war effort. Every able-bodied person in North Vietnam participated in the defense against the Americans. Anti-aircraft gunnery accounted for some 85% of all U.S. aircraft losses over the North. Over the hostile landscape of North Vietnam, American planes weaved through the violent labyrinth of anti-aircraft flak that darkened the sky. To make matters worse was the presence of Soviet-built surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, which honed in on the powerful radar emitted from the sophisticated American planes. 
In an attempt to quiet North Vietnamese guns, Crusaders were outfitted with a hard point on the port wing, enabling the pilot to fire Zuni rockets. Zuni rockets are an air-to-ground weapon used extensively in the suppression of anti-aircraft gunners and SAM sites. Many Crusader pilots saw themselves as fighter jocks, and they didn't cherish the idea of using their thoroughbred fighter in the role of ground suppression. Fighting MiGs is what the plane was designed to do. However, the military realities of Vietnam meant that many of these pilots would spend more of their time diving headlong towards North Vietnamese gunners than dogfighting with MiGs. Hurtling through the fray of artillery and ground fire may not have been the preferred mission of Navy Crusader pilots, but for the Marine pilots, it came with the job. Not all Crusader squadrons operated off the decks of carriers. By the end of 1965, most Marine squadrons were consolidated at Da Nang. Marine Crusader pilots were responsible for combat escort, flak suppression, and ground support. It was here that Major General Williams flew his first tour with the Marines. 235, the Death Angels. Uh, I joined them in Da Nang in summer of 1967. And uh, within a week, we were flying uh, combat escort missions for the bombers up north. We would uh, take off loaded with uh, guns and sidewinders and fly fighter escorts for the A-6s going up to, uh, to bomb North Vietnam. Pretty exciting for a young kid on his first combat tour. On the ground, U.S. forces were fighting an increasingly difficult battle. The North Vietnamese fought an ambush style of warfare that often caught besieged army and marine platoons by total surprise. When an attack was underway, embattled ground forces depended heavily on air support. Using either radar controlled beacon or radio, the forward air controller could give the aircraft the exact location of the enemy. Although the intruders and Skyhawks were the Marines' primary ground support planes, the Crusader carried out this job with lethal proficiency. The Zuni rocket was a simple yet effective weapon. Screaming down towards the target called in by the ground troops, the Crusader pilot simply aims and fires. One tactic used in the ground support role was to fire Zuni rockets with phosphorus warheads into the target area. The black smoke rising from the impact point provided a target that the onrushing dive bombers could easily identify. It is difficult to measure the success of close air support in the Vietnam War. As rockets and bombs disappeared into the thick jungle canopy, the best a pilot could hope for was news that his ground troops had been reprieved. The best missions were obviously the ones we flew in support of our ground troops. That was the most satisfaction when the guy on the ground would tell you, great job, you just saved a bunch of my Marines' lives. As with all naval aviators, the mission is never complete until the aircraft comes back aboard the ship. There is a saying among aviators that flying is man's second greatest thrill, landing. There are many medical studies done in Vietnam during the war where pilots over a period of years were hooked up with heart monitors by the flight surgeons in the squadrons. And uh, the results were the same every single time. The heart rate of the pilots coming back aboard those carriers at night was always higher than it was when they were in combat over North Vietnam. As the Vietnam War dragged on, the Crusaders' involvement steadily decreased. 
In 1967, the F-4 Phantom logged more flight hours than the Crusader for the first time in the war. Like the great Navy fighters of World War II, the Crusader was a gunfighter. But by the late 60s, air-to-air -air missiles and beyond visual range radar had rendered the gunfighter obsolete. Also, the Navy's growing aversion to single-engine planes coupled with an aging airframe resulted in its eventual replacement by its longtime shipmate, the Phantom. Many of the retired crusaders found a home with the navies of France and the Philippines. NASA found the speedy gunfighter a valuable tool for research and photography. Like the famed Corsair of World War II, the Crusader's role as a fighter remains only as a proud chapter in the history of Vought. In June of 1989, the last of the gunfighters prepares to take off for one final flight. The Crusader retired as a Navy fighter in 1976, the same year the Navy retired the last of its small Essex-class carriers. Considering the long relationship between airplane and ship, this dual retirement was appropriate. The Crusader would continue in its role as a photo bird well into the 80s until it was replaced by the F-18 Hornet. There is really no modern equivalent to the F-8 Crusader. For the past three decades, the Defense Department has demanded that all new aircraft must perform a variety of functions, from aerial combat to bombing. Multi-mission aircraft have forever replaced the proud line of pure fighters that began in World War I and ended with the Crusader. As the last of the gunfighters departs Andrews Air Force Base, another chapter in naval aviation history is closed. <laughs>